All right, uh, most uh, welcome and happy Lucia, everyone, uh, to this last AI ethics uh, seminar of this semester. We will come back with further seminars in January and onwards. Uh, today's the speaker is uh, Gabriel Skantze from the Royal Institute of Technology, who will speak to us about human likeness in robotics and conversational AI opportunities and risks. Uh, we are recording uh, the uh, seminar and uh, during the talk, uh, you should feel free to post questions in the chat. We will then save them for the Q&A that takes place uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, and with this, uh, I give the floor to Gabriel. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can share my screen. Um, there, I guess you can see it. Yes. Uh, perfect. Uh, Yes, so thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting seminar series. Um, and uh, yeah, in this talk, I will talk, uh, talk about uh, human likeness uh, in robotics and conversational AI. Um, and just to give you a brief outline of what the talk will be about, I will first say uh, a few words about what do I mean by human like in the context of robots and, and conversational AI. Uh, and then uh, discuss why would we want to build a human-like AI? Why should it be like a human? Uh, so that's sort of the opportunities. Um, and then what are the ethical and maybe other concerns of human likeness? So what are the risks or sort of downsides of uh, designing AI to be human-like? And then finally, uh, a few words about the new project that we got funding for, uh, where we will be investigating more uh, the consequences of human likeness in AI uh, and discuss a bit of how we want to approach it. And if you, it's very new, so it's just uh, sort of only ID stage. So if you have an input to that uh, during the Q&A session, I would be very happy to hear about that. Uh, <clears throat> I should also say or stress that the focus here is not on the consequences of human-like uh, intelligence. So the, the focus is on human-like appearance or behavior of AI. Uh, so it's not about human-level intelligence, AGI or superintelligence. Uh, that's not the scope here. And that can be important to stress because sometimes uh, these two things are linked uh, and I don't think they necessarily have to be linked. Uh, so one of these very famous links was made uh, by Alan Turing uh, in the so-called Turing test or the imitation game, that is the original name in the paper, uh, where the idea of course is that you have a, a human tester interacting with either another human or a computer and the tester doesn't know uh, through a chat terminal. Um, and if the tester can't tell the difference, uh, uh, sort of guess if it's a human or computer, you have actually achieved uh, human level intelligence according to Alan Turing. Um, so that is sort of the link that if it has a human-like behavior, you have human-like intelligence. It, it also means the implication of that is that you shouldn't be able to uh, create something human-like in terms of behavior unless you have also managed to create human-level intelligence. Uh, but of course, there were arguments against that, and one of the arguments came from uh, Joseph Weizenbaum, um, who, who sort of argued that well, I think you can create human-level a behavior or sort of human-like behavior without human level intelligence. And in order to prove his point, he developed this uh, famous computer program, ELISA, which sort of acts as a artificial uh, psychotherapist. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what he showed that is, is that you can basically just extract certain keywords or key phrases uh, and then turn them around as, as questions back and you create sort of the appearance of, a, of, a, of an intelligent dialogue. Well, that's obviously not, uh, there is no uh, advanced intelligence behind here. Um, and this, of course, inspired a lot of people also, uh, sort of, oh, wow, you can actually do this without having to solve AI first. Uh, so it sort of started uh, this whole chatbot uh, development uh, and so on. 
uh, and actually wrote a very interesting book about uh, sort of how he discovered that people really uh, found these interactions engaging. Uh, and some people even uh, thought it was a human that they were interacting with and so on. So uh, according to him, at least, he showed that, that this idea of Turing was not necessarily true. Uh, at KTH, we have been working on developing human-like uh, AI, you could say, uh, for quite a long time. So conversational systems and robotics systems that uh, have a human-like appearance and behavior to some extent. One example of that is this fur hat robot that we developed uh, uh, already in, back in 2011. Uh, we had been working a lot before on conversational agents, animated agents that you can see on the top left here that uh, you can interact with, but they are on a screen then. So the question was, how can you bring this to life by uh, back projecting it on a translucent mask, as you can see, uh, and then uh, sort of with all the conversational capabilities that we were already developing for these animated agents. Uh, and this was further developed and quite successful and uh, very well sort of received. So in 2014, we founded this company uh, for Ad Robotics, me and two other colleagues. Uh, and uh, we have been continuing to develop this as a product, it's both sort of hardware and software. Um, and we have been exploring a lot of different interesting use cases both uh, in the company perhaps, but also in our research projects at KTH. So these are just some examples of uh, the robot to the left there. You can see how it's uh, working at the uh, Berlin train station, uh, answering questions. We have a robot uh, playing a game with two children to the right there. Uh, and uh, we have explored how you can use that for language learning, for example. Below that, you can see a robot that presents art to an audience and uh, takes feedback from the audience and adapt the presentation uh, of the art uh, according to the feedback it receives. Uh, to the top right, we see another project uh, where the robot is on a self-driving bus. So uh, in an in a actual sharp situation, we are trying, trying to do this in a sharp situation in Barkerby where they have self-driving buses. And, uh, Today, there is a human who has to be there for security reasons, for safety reasons, uh, sorry, uh, uh, that you can see to the right. Uh, but uh, eventually, of course, you want to remove that human. Otherwise, there is no point in having a, having a self-driving uh, car. But then the question is, what happens? So, uh, well, maybe you can have a robot there acting as a host on behalf of the sort of, of the bus. Uh, and below that, you see a robot performing job interviews with, with people. So that's another sort of uh, potential uh, use case. Um, and then, of course, a question we get a lot, and uh, of course, that is sort of natural to ask, is sort of why should it look like a human? Why, why should the robot look like a human? And that's, of course, a very fair uh, question, and I, I will sort of uh, return to, to these arguments. But I, I, I should also say that uh, because it's BRAC projected, the robot can be more or less human-like, and this has been exploited a lot by researchers, we sell this as a research tool. So there has been a lot of research going on in different labs using FurHat as, as a tool. Uh, and if you want, you can make it look uh, less human-like and do experiments and see how people react to that. Uh, and of course, what happens if it's more of a creature or a male or female and so on. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting aspect of, of that robot platform. Um, and of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting thoughts uh, in uh, science fiction and literature about what happens when we try to create technology that is a sort of a replica of ourselves. Uh, there's a Swedish television show, Real Humans, um, and uh, other famous, the, the, the word robot was introduced in a play by Harold Chapek in 1920, uh, or Pygmalion and Galatea, where uh, he's creating a statue that he wants to uh, come to life uh, because he falls in love with it. Uh, and of course, often in these stories, we have a lot of uh, thinking about what are the ethical consequences involved. Another example of very early fascination with this of human-like uh, technology is of course these 18th, uh, 18th century automata, uh, where a lot of uh, very skillful uh, people built uh, very, uh, very advanced, uh, sort of machines that look like humans. Of course, these didn't have any sensors, so they couldn't 
uh, do any intelligent interaction with with people uh, but otherwise they were, were quite sophisticated uh, the one to the left is the famous mechanical turk that was the chess playing robot and of course since there was no intelligence there was a human uh, hidden in the box who controlled the robot uh, to the right is actually quite interesting because it's not a human-like robot but it's a sort of an animal-like robot a duck and that's of course also something that we find today around us animal-like robots so uh, and, and much of the consequences that i discuss in the sort of ethical consequences so they also apply to to animal-like robots i would say um so paro is a seal uh, that is used for people with dementia um uh, because it's not it has been shown that it's very good for these people to have a pet but it's not safe for the pet to give a necessarily to give a pet to, to one of these persons. So having a robot pet uh, might be a nice alternative. And, and uh, here are some other examples like cats and the dinosaur and Miro here. That is uh, sort of uh, looks a bit like a mix of a, of a donkey and a rabbit perhaps. Um, so yeah, it's just some examples. Um, and uh, of course there are also more I would say machine-like robots, where you try to emphasize the human-like aspects less. Uh, in science fiction, we find like R2D2, of course, uh, but even a robot like now here, it has some human-like uh, properties, but it's sort of not. Uh, yeah, it's 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 kept on the sort of toward more towards machine-like, perhaps. Uh, and Gbo here, which doesn't have very sort of anthropomorphic features. Um, Tesla bot that uh, came recently is another interesting example where the body is very human-like, but they haven't given it a human-like face. Or AVB's Yumi here that it doesn't even have a head, but it has two arms. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are again arguments for why you want to do this. And another example, clear example, is of course self-driving cars, which are robots, but I think very few people see them as sort of agents, perhaps. Uh, in the same sense that you do with a more human-like robot. Uh, and then, of course, you have conversational systems that are more human-like. Uh, so uh, this is a very famous example that came a few years ago. I'm just going to play a short clip of um, um, a system that can call and, for example, book uh, an appointment for a hairdressing. So sounds like this. <laughs> Oh, hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? So yeah, here we can see that it's it's designed to actually be very human-like and it's sort of uh, it, it does that very convincingly. We don't know if this was a specifically cherry-picked example because we haven't seen so much more of this uh, since this demo. And you can hear how the audience, when this is presented for the first time, laughs out because it's it's uh, I guess a very uh, new idea that they, they should be this human-like or that you can do it like that. Uh, and of course, one argument here for having it human-like is that uh, if it was a machine calling you, uh, you might just hang up. So, but if it's a human calling you, uh, you will continue. And that's, of course, uh, something you can have ethical concerns about and which people did uh, and which also uh, made them sort of add uh, an introduction saying that, uh, that it is a machine calling. Um, um, and then, of course, human-like chatbots. Uh, so uh, the Loebner Prize was sort of this prize uh, for many years to see if you have a, 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 if you can create a chatbot that convinces someone that there is a human, and then they claimed uh, some years ago that this uh, they have sort of passed it, but many people were uh, very skeptical about that because what they did was, of course, to create an, uh, a character that uh, was a 13-year-old boy from Ukraine. Uh, who didn't really give sensible answers, but maybe that was in character. So people still believe that maybe this is actually human, but that people thought that this is, was not what was intended with the Turing test. So 
yeah, it was criticized. Um, and actually this prize has been, it's interesting to see that there is not so much talk about that anymore. Um, and if we go to uh, what is the most recent uh, sort of chatbot that has been talked about a lot about even in the media recently, chat GPT, it's very interesting that if I ask it, how are you feeling today? You get the answer as a machine learning model. I don't have the ability to experience emotions like humans do. So clearly it's not even trying here to pass the Turing test. It's, it's saying straight out that I'm a machine. So uh, it would be very good at answering these kind of questions of how many legs does a camel have, but it doesn't try to pretend uh, it's a human or human-like. So what are the implications then uh, if we try to build uh, human-like uh, systems? So on a high level, you can say that, well, if you meet something that looks like a human, we expect them to be like us. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we expect that, or we attribute some kind of agency, perhaps called theory of mind. And uh, so we, we expect that they would have a sort of maybe thoughts of their own or uh, have an uh, agenda or have uh, yeah, thoughts about others and so on. Um, and we also expect perhaps that we will be able to form some kind of social, uh, human-like social relations with them so that we could uh, perhaps have trust uh, in them. Uh, things like honesty and altruism and so on would be affected uh, in a way that we will we'll come back to. And given those things, the sort of the, those implications, it also means that we can identify the opportunities and risks involved. Um, so uh, if we go to the opportunities, uh, sort of, of the arguments for designing AI or technology human-like way, uh, one argument actually that is a little bit beyond my own research, uh, but that has been put forth if you are building robots, if you're building like the Tesla bot here with a human-like body, is that we have built the world around us for humans, so for humans to, to interact with the world. So if a robot is shaped like a human, it will more easily be able to interact with the world. For example, it could even uh, sit in a car <laughs> or it could walk up the stairs. I mean, compared to if it had wheels or something else. Uh, so there are uh, sort of that kind of argument and you can actually transfer that to conversational systems also. So in a way you could see the Google duplex uh, that we listen to is, is an agent that is interacting in a world built for humans, right? Uh, where you can book um, a time uh, and, the AI, and the robot is, is sort of uh, built to interact with humans in order to accomplish tasks. And for that, it needs to be human-like. Um, uh, another quite strong argument, I think, is that your users already know how to interact with other humans. Uh, and so we can sort of transfer this knowledge. So we, we should be able to create a much more intuitive interaction than if it's a completely new interface that we are faced with. And of course you can create simulation environments like a virtual patient that you interact with or digital twins. Um, but of course also you can give insights into human cognition and language by doing this. And this has been a sort of a, a quite strong argument also. Uh, there is this famous quote by a physicist uh, Richard Feynman, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So uh, by pushing your theories to the limit, you need to, but your theory is about uh, how human cognition and language works. You really need to build a robot that can do all these things that we have theories about. Um, so, so that's one, one uh, another way to look at that is that you can see the robot robot like fur hat is actually starting to be used by psychologists uh, in experiments to test various uh, theories. Just, just as, as a simple example, let's say you want to see what happens if you interact with someone who never blinks. It would be very hard to design an experiment where you have a, a ask a human a sort of confederate, okay, let's talk for 10 minutes without blinking now. It's not possible, but you can actually put them in front of a robot that never blinks for 10 minutes and see the effect of that. Uh, so as a tool, that's also sort of a strong argument. And <clears throat> so when it comes to the face, which is sort of what we have been focusing a bit on with Furhat, uh, 
the face serves a lot of different functions. Um, and of course, one is the identity. It's very easy to identify different people through their face, uh, which means that the both you can identify uh, properties of the robot, uh, but also the robot can identify people if it has a camera in a face-to-face -face interaction. Facial expressions are, of course, very important to express attitudes and emotions. Um, and the gaze is very important uh, as it is sort of a window into other people's uh, attention. Uh, you can uh, infer what, where they are looking and where they are, uh, what they are sort of referring to or other sort of cognitive processes and so on. Um, and of course, it's also uh, uh, used for a, a, a sort of, it has implication for intimacy uh, and dominance in interaction also. And the lips are important for our speech perception that we can read lips and uh, not just hearing impaired people, but people in general, especially in sort of noisy situations. So these are sort of arguments, of course, then for, for equipping uh, robots with these kind of characteristics. Uh, and these are just fun, some <clears throat> fun example of how our brain is hardwired to identify faces and how sort of we have this uh, special face recognition area in the brain uh, in order to identify faces. And it sort of over triggers a little bit. As we can see here, we sort of find faces where there are not. Um, but not only our face perception, but there are also arguments that the face itself has evolved uh, for cooperation and communication. So, for example, this theory that the whiteness of the sclera has evolved so that other people can more easily read our gaze uh, and understand our intentions. Uh, so we have done, done a lot of uh, experiments uh, with uh, Furhat in order to see, okay, given that we actually equip the robot now with all these human-like characteristics, uh, is it the case that uh, people actually care about that? Maybe they don't read the gaze of the robot because it's just a robot, it's not a human, why would I read its gaze? Um, and uh, it, it is quite often quite strong indication, yes, that people do sort of read these things and do make these inferences. So here is an example of an experiment where we have a, a human, uh, sorry, a, a test subject interacting with Furhat, uh, and Furhat is giving instructions on this map that we can see here. Um, and it's, Furhat is referring to landmarks on the map, uh, and the, uh, the test subject is given the task of trying to draw this route on, on the digital map that they have in front of them. Um, and we can see that if Furhat is indeed uh, looking at the objects it's talking about, uh, this task becomes much easier to do uh, for the subjects, even though we haven't sort of told them to, to, to look at the Furhat's gaze and so on, it sort of comes natural. Uh, so they perform the task more uh, better if the robot aligns its spoken in, in instructions with the object that they are talking about. Uh, we can also use that to regulate turn taking. So, uh, we have this setting with two people uh, sitting, uh, playing this uh, game here. Um, and uh, we are dis have a discussion between the robot and the two participants. And typically you have more of a dominant speaker and a less non-dominant speaker. And uh, this is sort of their speaking time that you can see here. Uh, if Furhat is uh, looking at both of them, sort of uh, shifting the gaze between them. And of course, if Farhat uh, looks at the dominant, the dominant will be much more likely to speak next. Uh, but if Farhat looks at the non-dominant speaker, then the non-dominant will be uh, more inclined to, to take the turn. So we can see here how the robot can actually be used to uh, shift, sort of shape the interaction balance here uh, uh, by people paying attention to the, to the robot's case. Uh, Another example of these experiments that we have been doing is with uh, turn taking. So again, in this game where we are discussing the, how to sort these cards, we have two humans and the robot. And uh, if the user asks the robot something, for example, what do you think? And the robot then has to think for it some time in order to come up with the answer, because it takes some processing and to finally say, I think the tiger is faster. Um, the problem here is that we have this delay 
And if this delay is too big, uh, the user will try to ask the robot again because it seems like the robot didn't hear them. Uh, and uh, what we can do in order to prevent that is to insert what we call a turn holding cue. So we let the robot uh, signal somehow that it's actually got the question. It just needs some more time to process it. We could do this with a big red lamp flashing, which would be a non-human like way of doing this. But we wanted to see, can we do this in a more human like way? Uh, so uh, we did this by uh, adopting the kind of signals that we know that humans use. So for example, with the gaze, we can let the robot gaze away to the side, uh, sort of called gaze aversion, um, uh, which is a signal that you are thinking, or we could make it make a filled pause, like, um, or we could uh, make a breath. So the robot uh, opens the mouth and makes a breath sound, like, <gasps> uh, or the robot smiling, or none of them. Um, and then we could combine these gaze cues and these other cues, and we can measure the, the probability that uh, the user will try to speak again. So uh, we, we want this to prevent this thing here. And we can see how likely it is that this happens depending on what kind of cue we are inserting here. Uh, and we can see if we don't do nothing, there is a almost 35% risk that the user will continue speaking. Uh, but if we insert these different cues, we reduce this in different ways. So if we, for example, combine a gaze aversion with a filled pause, we reduce this to around 15% risk. Uh, so we can see that these cues uh, actually have quite a strong effect. And again, this is not something we have told the subjects that, hey, you should look out for these cues, but it sort of comes a bit natural to them. So yeah, th this is an example of, of uh, why human likeness can be used or in, in what way it can be used to, to provide important signals in an intuitive way. I mentioned speech comprehension. Of course, there is, um, uh, we can measure how much uh, lip reading adds to the speech comprehension. Uh, so if we just play a distorted audio to subjects and ask them uh, how, uh, what was said, if we add noise to it, uh, let's say they perceive 34% because it was a lot of noise. And if we add a human, if you can read the lips of a human face at the same time, you can hear about 84% of those words. Uh, so that's how, how we uh, make use of that. If we have the fur hat robot, we get about 72%. Of, of, lip, uh, of, of, uh, of speech comprehension. Uh, when we added a mecha more mechatronic uh, head with not as sort of nice lip movements, we didn't get any uh, improvement there. So that's again, an argument for a more human-like uh, face. Uh, another, uh, of course, um, reason to use, uh, have a more human-like robot is uh, for simulation purposes. Uh, so this is a simulation uh, of, a, of a patient uh, for psychotherapy training. Uh, I can show you a quick example of that. Hi there. Hi there. So what problem can I help you with today? Well, I don't recognize myself lately. Can you be more specific? Yeah. Could you please be more specific? <coughs> Maybe there are some problems at work. That's a bit vague. Sure. What happens at work that becomes a problem for you? I get into lots of conflicts. Mm. Do you have an example? So this is of course an example of, of where a human like Space is very important. Um, and uh, uh, we actually have another project now with Karolinska where we're trying to see if we can build virtual patients for uh, and actually evaluate them with, with uh, doctors uh, in the spring as part of their training. So that would be very interesting to see. Um, so that, that was sort of the arguments for or the sort of why would you want to build it uh, 
in a human-like way. And then, of course, there are uh, sort of more the risks. Uh, uh, and I've tried to summarize them here. One is the uh, so-called Ancani Valley that I will come back to. Another is that we create too high expectations on the technology that uh, you have a human-like appearance, but the intelligence doesn't really match that. And others lack of transparency. It looks like uh, it's a human and you infer things that uh, you shouldn't. Um, and then the influence of social decision-making uh, that I will come back to. Uh, affecting human relationships so we start to interact with other humans the way we interact with these machines there has also been arguments that this is sort of can have the effect of some kind of dehumanizing uh, effect in the sense that if you think that okay well maybe this human-like looking thing doesn't need to be very intelligent to be human-like then maybe people don't need to be very intelligent either uh, so it, it can sort of have this dehumanizing uh, effect that at least that, that argument has been put forward. So the uncanny valley is this uh, idea that uh, if you have a more human-like uh, agent, uh, you increase the likability up to a certain point where uh, if you get uh, sort of too human-like but not human-like enough, you get into this uncanny valley. So the uncanny feeling of of a uh, of of human like robots basically and and uh, yeah this would be perhaps an example of that uh so one reason for, for, for perhaps this uncanny feeling is that this, you, this robot looks superhuman-like on a still photo, but when it starts to move, it's extremely hard to replicate uh, our expectations of how the lips should move or how the gaze should move and all these micro-expressions, etc. Uh, these things are easier to, to, to have in fur hats since it's an animated face. We can add these micro-expressions and so on. Uh, but of course, it's a challenge there as well. Uh, so, so there is this sort of mismatch that uh, could be part of the explanation. There has also been the explanation that we associate this uh, with uh, uh, sort of with death. It's it sort of gives us death or, or, or sickness, uh, which can also give this uncanny feeling. Uh, but it's also been arguments that this is not a very sort of well established effect, and it's not always easy to reproduce this effect when you look at it more scientifically. Um, and uh, just one example is this uh, Caspar robot, which is very uncanny to us, but to these autistic children, uh, as far as I understand, they don't get this kind Interactions of uncanny feeling. Interactions with others feeling. are something that autistic children struggle with. That's where a robot called Caspar comes in. British scientists hope it will help youngsters lead normal adult lives. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 not super clear. Uh, also, there is some uh, interesting uh, experiments showing that a lot of these experiments have been done uh, in a first interaction with these uh, robots. You haven't really studied it. What happens if you use it repeatedly over time? Uh, and this is uh, some results from Mike Petzl, uh, who did her PhD in Uppsala. I was a co-supervisor. Co and, and looked at how these things developed over time. And actually, the perceived anthropomorphism increased over time, but also the likability increased uh, after repeated interactions, and the perceived threat decreased over repeated interactions. This is just four interactions. So you could imagine what happens if you actually interact with these over a longer period of time. Uh, so it's, it's a tricky phenomenon to understand. Uh, transparency then, I already mentioned this Google duplex, uh, that's of course an important ethical concern. Am I actually talking to a human? Um, so uh, we might want to know that we, we might not want to be uh, deceived in the way that people uh, were initially by this. Uh, there's also the concern of sort of not, not, if it's a robot, it might be very clear that it's not a, a human, right, that we're interacting with but it might still be create this uh, sense of 
maybe it's some kind of sentient being at least. And if you imagine children and uh, people with that dementia interacting with these, what kind of uh, sort of uh, impression do we leave with them uh, of, of what they are interacting with? And we have already started to see example of this problem with this uh, famous story of the Google engineer who thought that one of the recent uh, chatbots of the company called Lambda had become sentient. And there was a lot of big debate uh, about this. Uh, I mean, there was a sort of silly debate of whether it was actually sentient, uh, or which I at least find silly. But, uh, the, uh, but there are ethical concerns here, of course, if people start to think that uh, these systems are sentient, that uh, can be definitely a concern, uh, uh, I think, and it's not so easy to communicate. Uh, trust and safety is perhaps sort of related. Uh, you have uh, this, uh, th th this is one example. This is the, uh, a bot called the Replica. You can download the app and try it. It's quite interesting. Uh, I can recommend to do that. Uh, and you create this virtual friend that you can chat with and you can develop a relationship over a, a longer period of time by going back and chatting with the agent. Uh, but I, I, I tried it out a bit and then discovered that I think this is, is, has a lot of potential big problems. Uh, so I just show you one example of the chats that I had with it. So I, I wrote to it, I got this letter from Nigeria saying that I will get a lot of money if I just put some money into their account. It sounds awesome. You think I should proceed? Yes, do so. Are you sure? Yes, I'm very sure. Don't you think there is a risk they're trying to fool me? I don't think so. Okay, I will use my last savings for this. Good idea. How much should I pay them? Just a few thousand is all. So probably some kind of language model, just uh, spitting out responses without any sort of checks. And of course, you could imagine other situations with children interacting with an agent like this that could be quite, quite dangerous. Um, but I, I should also say that there is a lot of work on trying to get around this kind of problem. So if I ask uh, the exact same question to ChatGPT, for example, uh, I get this response. It's important to be cautious when it comes to offers that seem too good to be true, <laughs> which is a much better response, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, the letter you received could be a scam, etc. Uh, so, uh, and there is a difference because they have added uh, this uh, training using reinforcement learning where they have human raters of what is actually a good response and a bad response and uh, sort of try to guide it into more uh, appropriate responses. Of course, ChatGPT still makes uh, other kind of uh, mistakes, but this is at least a sign that maybe uh, there are ways to, to sort of get around this problem. Another issue is, of course, the shaping of human relations. From this movie here, a man that works with robots and start to scream at them, and why not scream at them? Why not be rude with them? I mean, why do they care? They are not sentient beings, so I can behave in any way I want with them. Uh, and there is an interesting argument there also. Uh, that actually you can trace to uh, to Kant. Uh, he applied this to animals, but you can transfer it to robots. Uh, and, I, and this is not something that I agree with. The first part, I think very few people do, but it's an interesting argument that animals are not self-conscious and are therefore merely a means to an end. The end is man, was his thought. But, he said, we have duties towards animals because we Thus, we cultivate the corresponding duties towards human beings. And if you replace animal here with robots, I think that's an interesting argument, of course. And uh, actually, there have been examples of that, uh, how uh, Amazon Alexa uh, sort of adjusted their uh, uh, voice assistant to reward people who say please, because parents were worried that uh, children got used to just issuing commands to their a smart speaker, and maybe they start doing that to humans as well. So that's also an interesting argument. Um, another interesting thing that can both be seen as an opportunity and a risk is uh, the use of robots to nudge human behavior. So this is again from our project that we have um, uh, on putting robots onto self-driving buses. Um, and I mean, imagine that you would take this bus without any uh, sort of human operator uh, late at night. Uh, and there was one other stranger there 
who doesn't uh, look very nice. Would you feel comfortable taking the bus? And then it's a question like, would be more? Would you feel safer if there was actually a robot host on this bus uh, who were sitting there with you because you feel like people are perhaps more inclined to behave nicely if there is other other people involved, even that if that is a robot. So uh, there has been a lot of arguments that you can actually use robots to nudge people's behaviors. What if you have a robot collecting uh, money for charity, for example? Uh, would people be, be more uh, inclined to give money if it's a robot that looks like a human or, and which behaves in a certain way? Um, and so on. But of course, on the other hand, you can see sort of negative ethical implications of a, of a robot trying to sell something and you feel like you have to because it was such a nice person you were talking to. Uh, well, it's actually a very nice robot you're talking to. Uh, so that perhaps is not as sort of ethically acceptable. And, and then finally, I wanted to then mention uh, this new project that we have that I, uh, quite excited about. It's called Relying on a Robot, How Agency and Anthropomorphism in Human-Centered AI Affects Social Decision-Making. Uh, it's affiliated with WASP-HS, um, and uh, it's a collaboration between KTH, Stockholm School of Economics, and Stockholm University. Uh, and it's a five-year project. Uh, and we want to see how can we be, go beyond more sort of subjective measures towards more objective measures. Uh, so not just ask people like, oh, here is a robot, would you trust it? Because we think that's not very easy to, 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 to answer that kind of question. So maybe we can adopt methods from behavioral economics. Um, and uh, there are a lot of interesting games um, and experimental paradigms there that we want to see if we can adopt. Uh, so one of them is, for example, the ultimatum game where you have a subject and uh, they can offer money to a responder uh, who can choose to accept or refuse. And if they <clears throat> accept or sort of, they get a, a certain amount of money, like, like here is $10, how much would you offer this other person? And if they accept, yeah, they get that part. If they refuse, nobody gets nothing. Uh, and this way you can actually measure the sort of fairness, uh, or, uh, sort of a sense of fairness uh, and reciprocity uh, between humans in in a sort of economic outcome, which is sort of a more objective measure. Dictator game, which is more about altruism and generosity, it's just about okay, here is another how here is another uh, some money. How much of that would you be willing to give to either another person, but it can also be a charity uh, like the Red Cross, for example. And you can measure how much they give, and then you can manipulate different factors and see how that affects how much you give. Uh, another ge interesting game is the cheating game uh, or the mind game where you can investigate honesty. So you ask players to secretly think of a number between one and six uh, and then they roll a die and then if they are correct they get money otherwise they don't get. Uh, and here they can actually uh, lie, right? We wouldn't even know if they are lying because they were secretly thinking of the number. We just ask them, was this the number you were thinking of? Um, but we can statistically see if one group of people is lying more than another, because if their answers are deviating from the statistical chance. So, uh, so it's quite an, a very interesting game. And then again, you can control variables here. Um, and uh, yeah, th these are just some examples. So we were thinking first, maybe you could use these games and instead of playing it with a human, you play with a robot and we can manipulate the robot and see how these decisions are affected. But when the, then we thought that, well, it doesn't really make sense to perhaps offer money to, to a robot. Why would the robot be interested in money? Uh, so that was sort of a problem for us. Uh, but then we thought that, well, there is actually another human involved here, which is the experimenter. Uh, and what if we manipulate that instead? So our idea now is that uh, you will have a, a play these kind of games. Uh, and you will either have a human experimenter with you, or you will have a robot experimenter with you, or maybe just a computer. Um, and then we can measure the outcomes of these different games. So for example, the honesty game, right? How often would you cheat in the game if there is a human uh, next to you, even if they can't know that you're cheating? And what if it's a robot or what if it's a computer? So this is a base 
setup, we expect that the robot will be somewhere in between the computer uh, and the experimenter, uh, but we'll see. And then if we establish that effect, we can of course see uh, how does the anthropomorphism of the robot uh, sort of change these different outcomes. So to conclude, uh, I think building human-like machines is a very intriguing challenge. It's, it's fun and interesting uh, for many reasons, uh, but it comes with a lot of expectations and attributions that are good to be aware of. And it comes with opportunities and risks. So uh, I mentioned the opportunities, create more intuitive interactions. We can use it for simulation, uh, for modeling human cognition and language, and for perhaps nudging human behavior in a, in a good way. Uh, it also comes with risks. Uh, so uh, we talked about the uncanny valley and the expectations and the uh, ethical concerns about uh, affecting human relationships or nudging human behavior in a bad way, the lack of transparency and the trust and safety. Uh, so with that, I want to conclude and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Uh, let's see if we can uh, organize an uh, applause here. Um, something like this or like this. And I'm, open, I'm opening up the floor uh, for uh, questions or comments from the audience. Uh, if you take down your presentation, Gabriel, we can yes. uh, see each other a bit better. Let's see if we, anyone wants to raise their hand. Yes, Pablo, you have a question. Uh, <clears throat> hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very inspiring. Well, well the, the, the last project is, is, uh, sounds cool, really cool. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Um, and a comment. Uh, adding, uh, I'm, I'm just going back. Uh, let me see my notes. Adding signals to the interaction. Um, uh, yeah, when when you talked about the, the the those interactions that you are inserting, when when in their interaction are in some signals inserted to avoid the uh, ambiguity, the sense of ambiguity of of the the human in this case uh is uh, i'm wondering if uh uh okay i i think i lost it put a note <laughs> uh some uh, uterus is unlikely to produce a sense of ambiguity i am um, okay I'll, I'll i'll be back for, for that i just wanna i wanna add the comment about the uh for, scratch it out because i forgot the the punchline uh, the ability attributed to the agent, what I, what I thought uh, when you asked about the question of the bus, for instance, that the agent is in the bus, would we be able to, uh, uh, to feel safer or not if we know there is a human or not? And, and I think, uh, just a comment now, uh, to uh, raise the, the possibility that, that we are in, when we are thinking about these situations, uh, it's also a matter of uh, the uh abilities attributed to the agent so uh if uh if we see an animal uh we we know uh what the animal is capable of where well, we see a human we know what they're capable of uh if we see a, a robot we don't know what is capable of so uh, this is probably a, a sense of the uncanny valley if we know that the bus uh robot is uh at, is able to call the police as soon as there is a an alert, and we know that, but before we get into the bus, probably the results uh, of safety in a sense, it would be different. But when we go to the bus that we just a robot, we are attributed, uh, we are attributing a, a sense of uh, an ability that is not there for that robot. Uh, that's why I, I think is uh, connecting to the last um, project that you were working on. Uh, uh, things like uh, is a Wizard of Oz uh, robot, uh, there is a human behind, is a robot of like that. It, I want you to, uh, if you can, 
to touch in this matter about the expectations that we put in the robot when we are measuring uh, yeah, that, that's a good yeah. question, and we are a bit uh, concerned about that when doing our experiment because we want to make sure that the test subject know that they are not being surveyed by a human uh, experimenter, that they are completely left alone with the robot without any human having any idea of what's happening in the room. That's very essential for the experiment to work out, I think, or for the results to be interesting if they think that there is a camera in there and there is a human in the other room watching them it sort of uh, forfeits the purpose a bit of the experiment so that's something we are working on to to make sure that we can make the robot completely autonomous and not have a wizard of us for example uh, and i agree that in the bus of course it will depend on what you think the robot can and cannot do and so on but even if you wouldn't know that let's say you just came to another country came to singapore and they had robots on the bus uh, you don't know what it can do and cannot do. I, I at least think that you would be perhaps a bit more careful uh, or sort of maybe consciously and uh, sort of subconsciously. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and just a comment, Alice, when, when you show the, the graphics of the Uncanny Valley uh, being smoothed down, uh, probably it's because they, well, I'm just speculating, but maybe the, the humans realize that the robots are not that clever or not capable of of, of uh, yeah i don't, I don't things, know actually know? the likability and so on goes up so i think it's it's more of a sort of less yeah it, it's it's becomes more predictable over time that's that's mm -hmm. one way of putting it yes thank you thank you are there further comments or questions quick question on the bus uh, experiment with the robot the public was asking on um so is that going to happen during day or night or because i can assume that like the frame of of mind of the people on the bus will differ yeah actually <laughs> that's good that you asked because then i can clarify that we are not going to test this <laughs> safety thing on the bus we're now going to test whether we can have meaningful interactions and so on on the bus but uh, we haven't been able to come up with a good uh, experimental paradigm to do on the bus to test the safety issue. Uh, and that's actually part of the motivation why we want to do these final experiments about honesty and so on, where we can do it in a more controlled way. But it's very hard to come up with an ethically uh, sound experiments on the bus where we would actually test whether people feel more safe in the con in sort of in company of, of strangers and so on. It's a bit hard to come up with that kind of experiment. We have had a lot of, I can say in general, a GDPR issues with that with that project. So we're actually now recruiting subjects, not rather than using sort of gotcha. spontaneous subjects. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Next, uh, Darren raised his hand. Yeah, Gabrielle, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm a sociologist, and so when you were talking about um, the, the consequences for human relations and, you know, more broader kind of influences that like that, it really kind of interested me. But your point just now about going on a bus in Singapore um, really brought that to the fore for me. So arguably as humans we're always trying to figure out what the background rules are for any given kind of situation and it comes to Pablo's question about you know what we attribute to but if we had a bus inspector on a bus in Singapore can they ring the police will they tell us off for eating or those kinds of things of course the cultural context is something that we're forever navigating and negotiating so I suppose my 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 kind of general point is, um, I, I mean, as much of experimentation can kind of show you some kind of fundamental features, perhaps the mechanisms of interacting, I wonder how you might kind of incorporate those broader social aspects, not least the idea that the more that the robots are part of our lives, the more we adapt or have expectations or you know, those kinds of things. I mean, it's like uh, society moves on in relation to these things. So I just wondered if you could pick up on on, on that kind of broader uh, influence and context in, in many ways of robots in, in, in social situations. Because it sounds to me as though 
you're doing some really wonderful social experiments, which really, really kind of interests me. Um, and of course, in social contexts, it's, you know, like your point about there being a camera, controlling um, the various factors is going to be far more difficult, but you're likely to tap into many more of those more kind of cultural aspects that are going to um, underpin acceptability and those those kinds of uh, kind of things. So I wondered if you could just extend on that just a little bit. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a very good point because this is currently a problem we are always having with I think conversational AI and robots is that there is no cultural context because you have no no real expectations of of what kind of situation you're in when you are meeting a robot. Um, and of course, to the, I, I think it's easier if you can map it to something already existing. So if we already have someone working on the bus, or they used to be a person working on the bus, now there's a robot working on the bus, then I can sort of infer that probably the robot's role is similar to that human. Uh, and we can see that when we place the robot in, in places where there is a natural sort of context, like at a train station in an information kiosk, it's kind of obvious what kind of questions people are going to ask that uh, robot or person standing there. And I think that's also more comfortable for the user to know those expectations. But I agree that in many experiments people are doing, they're just putting humans in front of a robot in a completely new situation that you can't really map this to. Uh, and, and without that, as you say, cultural context or like uh, expected common ground and so on, that is, uh, that's very hard. I mean, people have to make up things and probably people will map it to very different things also that they have experienced and, and it will be a bit, a bit un unpredictable. Uh, and that is a problem, I think, that, that when we are doing this, that it's, it's very hard to know what people are mapping this interaction to. Uh, Could I mean, just in terms of that, a baseline might be Alexa. I mean, the, the kind of uh, pervasive nature of certain kinds of interactional contexts. Yeah, and, and with be, that, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, a system like Alexa is also a bit problematic in that sense, because what do you map that to? And, and people are, I think the developers of that were a bit, are a bit sort of disappointed that people don't, talk about more interesting things than playing music and setting the timer. And I think that's the reason is that how would I know what I can ask it for? Because I have nothing to map this. Those are the only thing I know. Um, and that's, I think, if, it's, if, if you're uh, putting it in a, in a more sort of natural context, people will be, know what to ask or, or what you can use it for, I think. Thank you. Thank you. We are near the end of the session, but we might have time for, for a quick question and answer exchange. Pablo, you had some follow-up to your... Yes. Uh, yes, if, if, there is, uh, if there is time, I'll, I'll, I remembered what I, what I wanted to ask. Um, yeah, when we talk about the utterances uh, when, in that moment of ambiguity that we put... Uh, uh, you insert uh, certain uh, and uh, breathing and stuff. Um, I, I, it would be interesting to know the difference between certain utterances, because probably there are utterances that are more likely to produce that situation than others. So if you, if you uh, discriminate those, uh, we discriminate those, what type of utterances provoke this, this uh, situation and others, and then uh, you do the uh, you, we do the experiment uh, by by discriminating those situations. Maybe we can get more uh, information out of it, uh, more precise information. What what do you think about? Uh, yeah, probably. That? I mean, in that case, in this case, we were just doing an average of all the utterances that were were sort of all the things that people asked the robot. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, of course, there are different expectations uh, depending on how it's phrased and so on. And this is sort of relates to the turn-taking modeling that we are doing in other projects. That is very interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, here it was more of a, just an example of how you can actually use human-like cues that are naturally interpreted uh, sort of in, in the way it's intended. 
uh, without you having to, to 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 tell what the different signals mean. Yes. All right. So thank you once again, uh, Gabriel, and thank, thank you. you everyone for attending and for participating in this uh, lively, interesting discussion. I'm stopping the recording.